Number six, the FBI test on the blood and the EDTA. Let me ask this. Was it the prosecution who had the courtroom animation about the blood vial when the FBI agent was testifying, or was it the FBI agent? Just curious. Part B. The FBI used to do EDTA tests, but now don't, apparently. Would a laser spectrometer not pick up EDTA in today's scientific society with new and advanced testing methods and tools? I find that odd. How and why, with all the blood vials everywhere, in order for it not to coagulate and hence have EDTA in them, would there not be one lab that would have a side niche specialty of processing this one thing for various crime labs? Supposedly, the reason that the FBI quit doing the test was because the test results were unreliable. I find that odd, too. We knew the atmospheric makeup of Neptune before Voyager, back before any of us had PCs, and yet we can't create a test to find EDTA in a blood sample? And if I remember correctly, why did they only admit three of the samples as negative? Why have six and only test three? I mean, cops wouldn't come in with a warrant, look around the living room and leave. They would check every room. Basically, what the FBI agent said is that if he were a teacher and since three of his students whose math test he looked at all got 0% on the test, then he could assume with a quote-unquote reasonable degree of scientific certainty that the other three students, which is 50% of your sample size, also got a 0% on their test. Good thing he's not a teacher. He's the lead chemist at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Boy, I feel safe. Part C. The argument was made by the other chemist on the stand that she didn't know their test methods and test limits, which is puzzling if you're going to use that at trial. Why would the FBI, in such an important case, so important that they retooled and got this done so fast, not have any information in that report? In the book, not the movie, the book, Jurassic Park, one of the main points of the book was that life finds a way. Ian Malcolm talks about how genetics is the ultimate force in the universe and thus far it has always survived. The movie was basically utilizing new tech special effects and coupled that with, ah, big scary dinosaurs got out, must get away before they eat me. The book was much more subtle. In the book Jurassic Park, scientists are convinced that the dinosaurs cannot breed because all of the animals are female and genetically controlled. In the book Jurassic Park, it has automatic sensors that can tell at any time where and when in each pen each dinosaur is and how many of them there are. When the park rangers show Ian Malcolm that they have seven stegosaurus, stegosauri, stegosaurus, seven stegosaurus in the pen, just like they're supposed to, Ian Malcolm then tells them to go into the computer scanner program and instead of telling it to look for seven stegosaurus, to instead look for 99 stegosaurus. And the sensors do a sweep, and lo and behold, it comes back with 13 stegosaurus. Stegosaurus? Stegosauruses? Steg stegosauri? I don't know. I'll have to look it up. Proving that the dinosaurs are breeding, but they did not know what they had until they used a different set of parameters for the test. Another way of looking at it is if you look at how many people attended a wedding, but your parameter is set to 90 and above. Then you could truthfully answer only one person, great grandma, came to my wedding. So knowing which testing method was used and how it works is very crucial to the case because if EDTA was actually found to be present in any of the six, not three, samples given to the FBI, then just like the bullet in the garage, which will be discussed soon, it's one of the only other things regarding physical evidence that could slam Stephen Avery behind bars for good or do the exact opposite to prove that evidence was planted. Part D. Just like with the Wisconsin voter ID law for the 2014 election, how was it that they got this retooling done so fast? Remember, if a person is thought to have been kidnapped and presumed alive, the FBI gets involved. So the argument really can't be made that the FBI had no prior involvement in this since they were called in when she was still a missing person. Was there any record of any FBI agent or any other LEO who was involved with the search contacting the scientists doing the blood test? Too many what ifs. If your five-year-old gave you the same defense about homework as the FBI did about the blood test, you'd ground them. If a teacher says that there are six pieces of homework and your child shows you the worksheet that has three questions that's been completed with shifty answers and he says that all of his homework is done, would you believe him? Garbage. You know you wouldn't, yet we're supposed to believe this tripe from the highest ranking law enforcement agency in the country. Number seven, Steve and Avery sweat on the key. How does the sweat get on the key, yet hers isn't? on cloth after six years of continuous use. I addressed this earlier, so I'm going to move on to the key itself being found in the house, which I also discussed. Number eight, they found the key in the house. Part A, why would he not burn the key in the fire, throw it in the pond or Lake Michigan, or at least into the key bucket? Part B, 
How does the one key not appear at all in the one picture of Stephen Avery's bedroom where the supposed assault took place, even though you're looking into the room from the hallway and you can see the slippers, but there's no key anywhere in sight, even though you can see right behind the business desk and in between the desk and the wall, well lit with a camera flash. Yet it appears on the seventh search after Link, who isn't supposed to be there, comes to the scene. Was that picture taken after the key had been found? If so, why would the key not be in the picture and why would you take the picture after you remove the key from the spot, especially if no other important piece of evidence was to be seen in that photo frame? Again, if the cop has the key, then the cop moved the car. I'll state this again because I think this is absolutely crucial. The prosecution's own witness, who was there on the stand, stated, whoever had the key was the one who killed Teresa. That is where I'm pretty convinced that they at least saw her dead, but there's no evidence to prove or at least indicate that they caused her death. Not to say it couldn't happen, not to say it's even not likely, but there's no evidence to point to that. That would be where the bullet hole size in the head comes in. That tidbit of information might lead the investigation in that direction, but aside from another witness coming forth, that's the only physical evidence to imply that possibility. And even then, say you take all the police officers that are supposedly involved, say the bullet hole in her head matches a 9mm, there's so many 9mm bullets out there that there's no way you could possibly tie it to any officer just because of a bullet caliber. Number 9. The mattress, the bed, the shackles, the garage. Part A. As stated under oath, none of Teresa Hallbach's DNA was anywhere in the house. Even the DNA technician that fudged the Teresa Hallbach DNA bullet testified there was absolutely none of Teresa Hallbach's DNA in either Stephen Avery's trailer, garage, or vehicles. All they have was a bill of sale and a notepad with Teresa Hallbach's number on it. Then again, they also had her PDA, etc., but that was on a different property, so no physical evidence that points to the actual accused crime occurring in those areas. Part B. There were no shackle marks on the bedposts, no DNA on them, no blood on the mattress, no spatter in the garage, yada yada yada. Number 10. Testimony of Dassey about the rape, mutilation, and murder from the film, not the interview. I'm separating the two because the interview will be discussed later. Part A. Notice that when Ken Kratz gives that fantasy press conference about what happened to Teresa Hallbach in the bedroom, he mentions not once, but twice, that Stephen Avery was sweaty. In fact, watch it again. Watch how he emphasizes the words sweat and sweaty. The Stephen Avery case article on True Crime Cases blog even have covered in sweat in quotes while describing the case. Why would they do that? Sort of reminds me of how in the movie The Doors with Val Kilmer, that when they're on the Ed Sullivan show and the producers ask the Doors that since this is network TV, that they should say, girl, we couldn't get much better instead of girl, we couldn't get much higher when singing the song Light My Fire on national TV because the standards and practices folk wouldn't appreciate that too much. But if you watch the actual real life live performance, Jim Morrison sings it with his eyes closed with the same flat inflection that he does on the actual album recording. But if you watch the movie, he clearly emphasizes the word higher to rub it in the TV producer's face and even runs up to the camera to get his full face in the shot and says, ha. So basically he says, girl, we couldn't get much higher, ha. That clearly didn't happen in real life, but the movie added it for nothing other than dramatic effect just like Ken Kratz did in the story he told. Funny thing about that Doors observation is that to this day, I've never seen the movie, The Doors. But that tidbit was told to me in college, so you're talking about 20 years ago, by a girl who noticed that discrepancy back then. She'd obviously seen the real footage somewhere because she knew the difference and there was really no such thing as the internet back then. Well, there was, but it was called the Information Superhighway and it was mostly text-based chat rooms. But before I wrote this, I did in fact check it out using the modern internet to see if she was correct. And lo and behold, 20 years later, she was spot on, exactly like she said it was. I only add that and tell that story to show what people will do to a story for dramatic effect, which is rather humorous because I opened this report by stating if this case were made into a book, it would sell five copies for lacking the true storyline for any sort of dramatic effect. But moving along. Why would he do such a thing, you might ask? Perhaps they have something to connect physical evidence to this bogus story when they miraculously find his sweat on her vehicle? Sounds like it to me, anyway. Remember, this was in March, after Brenda Dassey's testimony and before the judge ruled that the hood latch was out. Did they find the sweat before or after that testimony? Did they ever disclose that? And don't tell me, well, now they know to look for it. 
that isn't how forensic evidence is collected. Ken Kratz says his uncle answers the door after knocking three times, even though Brendan Dassey said he only knocked once. The man he knows as his uncle, Stephen Avery, is covered with sweat. Pause. Then says, Brendan Dassey accompanies his sweaty uncle down the hall to the bedroom. Blah, blah, blah. Ken Kratz could have said he was panting. He could have said he was excited. He could have said he was flustered. He could have said he was in a sexual rage. He could have used any number of adjectives to describe Stephen Avery, but he uses the one and only phrase that can physically corroborate actions to supposed evidence in this made-up story. Evidence that turns out to be so questionable that when they try to add it to the vehicle, it's thrown out. Part B. Also, even if you get sweaty from all that activity, would you still be sweaty after you supposedly finally get around to touching the car? And if you touched the car before all this happened, why would there even be sweat on it at all? Part C. If you're in the act of committing rape, would you say that's how you screw her? You'd probably not censor yourself in the most vicious act you could commit on a person if you're not killing them. Part D. After the rape, they go and they watch TV. I wonder what show was on. Did they ever ask him? So if you watch TV, you cool down and sweat disappears. So then where did the sweat on the RAV come from? Again, what is the time frame for the sweat transfer? Part E. Did they ever ask Brendan Dassey if he'd had sex before? Brendan, are you a virgin? Most 16-year-old boys would probably be pretty embarrassed to admit they were. Might have helped the cops out, but yet no one asked him? During the interview, they asked him why he did it, and his response was to see what it felt like. Wouldn't that be something that you would ask him questions about to make sure that he wasn't lying to you? Part F. I've watched the Dassey interviews from the film and read other articles trying to corroborate any parts of the story. He said to the police in the interview that she was wearing a blue shirt. She was seen last wearing a white shirt and jeans and a summer jacket. What color was the jacket? They never say that. It might help to know that if you're questioning someone, wouldn't you think? Yet they never ask it once. Another thing to note was that in the voicemail that she left for Stephen Avery or the Avery Salvage Yard, she said she would come out around 2 p.m. or maybe later. The Dassies testify that somewhere between 2.45 and 3.15, depending on which testimony you may believe, when each one of them saw her, the independent third witness, Brendan Dassie's school bus driver, who drops him off at around the same time every day, said she saw Teresa Halbach taking pictures of the van between 3.30 and 3.40 p.m. Why weren't the two, whose alibis were only each other, questioned about that time when they saw her? Part G. The knife they supposedly used to stab her and slit her throat was never found, and if it was, it obviously didn't have her blood or DNA on it, because it was never at trial. Again, he successfully hides the murder weapon and burns the body, but not the other key pieces of evidence? Part H. According to an article in MilwaukeeMag.com, after doing all this raping and slitting, then he cut her hair. So we have no evidence from stomach stabbing and throat slitting, we also have no evidence of hair. Hair that gets everywhere, much less bloody hair, from Teresa Holbach that corroborates this horrendous testimony. Every time I get my hair cut, even if I change shirts, I still itch from the little specks of hair still sticking around. Even after a shower, there's sometimes still residual hair. You might as well have your kindergartner tell you that he did this crime with his dad, because you'd walk into that room and ask if the boogeyman cleaned up, because there's not one shred of evidence to tie any of this story together. Part I. Stephen Avery then chokes her for two or three minutes. If someone shackled face up to a bed with a stomach stab wound, slit throat, and cut hair all over the place, you're going to get messy. Choking someone with a slit throat, you get blood freaking everywhere. Not to mention that when blood is wet, it's still pretty slippery. He wouldn't have much of a grip to try and strangle someone, but that's kind of a moot point. Part J. From the story in MilwaukeeMag.com about this testimony, here's what it says. Now, this is Brendan Dassey's story, quote, Seeing that she was still alive, Stephen Avery choked Teresa Halbach for two or three minutes, Brendan Dassey told police, then went to the bathroom to wash. The two unshackled Halbach's limp body tied her up with a rope and carried her to the garage. They then placed the body in the cargo bay of Halbach's car. Okay, where's this rope? Was it burned along with the supposedly bloody clothes? To continue the quote, Stephen Avery told Brendan Dassey he planned to dump the body in the pond at the salvage yard, but the pond was dry. I'll interject here because when Pam Sturm was giving her trial testimony, in the film at least, about finding her car, the aerial, and I'm guessing aerial because I don't think Google Maps was that sophisticated back then since Google Maps launched in February 2005, but nonetheless, the aerial map did show the pond at the salvage yard and the pond certainly was not dry. 
Granted, I don't know when the picture that was in use for the trial was taken, but if it was taken near the time of the investigation, then that argument is bogus. Because if you look at the weather from weather-warehouse.com from Manitowoc County precipitation month to month of 2005, there was half an inch of precipitation in October of 2005, at least one inch of precipitation every prior month, and eight and a half inches of precipitation in June. So to say that the pond was dry is probably a complete fabrication. Anyway, to finish the quote from the story, quote, But the pond was dry and Stephen Avery instead decides to burn the body in the fire pit behind the garage, a fire already smoldering in the pit. End quote. Why was the fire already smoldering? What was burning there before? How long was it there to be smoldering? Part K. I'm going to continue until the end of the segment quoted from the article, but I'm going to read it from the start in order so you could hear what's being said. Paragraph 1 and 2, which you've heard already, then go to paragraph 3. So here's the whole thing. Quote, paragraph 1. Seeing that she was still alive, Stephen Avery choked Teresa Hallbach for two to three minutes, Brendan Dassey told the police. Then went to the bathroom to wash. The two unshackled Hallbach's limp body tied her up with a rope and carried her to the garage. They then placed the body in the cargo area of Hallbach's car. Paragraph 2. Stephen Avery told Brendan Dassey he planned to dump the body in the pond at the salvage yard, but the pond was dry and Stephen Avery instead decides to burn the body in a fire pit behind the garage, a fire already smoldering in the pit. Paragraph 3. Before carrying her to the pyre, Stephen Avery lay Hallbach on the garage floor and walked to the house for his 22 semi-automatic rifle. He then fired 10 rounds into Hallbach's body. That's a direct quote from the story. Three paragraphs, all in order, nothing omitted. First off, why did they drag her to the garage, then put her in the cargo hold of her own car, then bring her back to the garage, then shoot her ten times in the stomach. No mention of the gunshots to the head, which is supposedly where the magic bullet came from, both for evidence, testimony, and forensics to tie her to actual blood they found, transferred to the cargo bay by her own hair, in her own car, mind you, then decide to simply carry her, this bloody mess that they've just washed up from, to the pyre? What the... Play that again if you don't believe me. You can also find it online. Not to mention they wash up before tying, moving to the garage, moving to the car, moving back to the garage, shooting and carrying the bloody body to the fire. Put on your best white suit. It's spaghetti time. Keep in mind they also found no DNA on the barrel of Stephen Avery's gun that was tied to the magic bullet that was found in the garage. Kind of hard to shoot someone who's on the ground with all those shell casings from a semi-automatic ejection system landing in the garage itself without being close enough for blood spray blowback to get on the barrel of a rifle. According to the testimony of Deputy Remaker of the Manitowoc County, remember, they aren't supposed to be anywhere near the salvage yard, Manitowoc County, he said 11, 22 caliber shell casings, yet no bullets, including the magic bullet, were found on the initial search, as corroborated by the photograph. But even though they had the shell casings, they wouldn't have looked for bullets in the slim chance that even though there's no blood, some shots might have happened there? But apparently they did because Deputy Remaker, when asked if they were looking for bullets, he said, well, we were looking for everything. Nothing was found over eight days of searching over the course of five separate entries, yet they found them four months later when, lo and behold, Lieutenant Link was there, the same guy who signed off on the blood and found the key when no one from Manitowoc was supposed to be there and with falsified logs to boot. Not to mention, you could tell by looking at the log that somebody shoehorned Lieutenant Link's name into the log. And yet there are still going to be people out there that can say without a shred of doubt that there isn't even the slightest possibility that something fishy could have happened here. So with this analysis, if he shot her 10 times and once in the head, which would make 11 bullets, which is supposedly what they found in the garage, 11 casings, why would there be two gunshot wounds to the skull as presented in the courtroom animation? One shot to the parietal lobe and one shot to the occipital lobe, correct? That makes 12 shots, and if they supposedly found 11 casings, where are the other bullets? Two in the head, 10 in the stomach. Not to mention that if the 22, which doesn't have the punch or power that larger calibers have, if they remain in the body, why weren't those 10 bullets found in the fire with the skeleton? If any of them did exit the body or the head, where are those bullets along with the magic one found with the contaminated DNA? Where's the blood and the tissue spatter from the exit wounds, both in the garage and on the rifle? Where's the dripping blood from both dragging her out there, the shots themselves, and moving her body away? Yet, 
nothing, not a single shred of any evidence except the one magic bullet that they found only after this Brandon Dassey story came out and Lieutenant Link, who wasn't supposed to be there, showed up with falsified log times, the same man who found the key on the seventh search. Hmm. Very interesting, but stupid. Part I. Here's the next paragraph in the same story. Quote, Using Dolores Avery's golf cart, the two collected old tires, brush, and a wooden cabinet to place in the fire as the body burned. Okay, first off, why didn't they use the SUV that her body was already in, supposedly, at one time, to move the collected incendiary pieces considering it can traverse a salvage yard better and has far more cargo space than a freaking golf cart? That's like climbing Mount Everest with a fanny pack. Also, it said, to place in the fire as the body burned which would indicate that it was already burning. Have you ever lit a steak on fire or a chicken breast? It doesn't burn. It cooks, but it doesn't burn. You have to get flesh pretty hot for itself to burn. Crematoriums use fire that is hundreds of degrees hotter than fire that most people can make in their backyard, about 1,400 to 1,800 degrees and upwards of 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Even burning that body at that temperature in a crematorium takes two to three hours. That, and I also read that it would be very difficult to get an open-air fire to burn hot enough to cremate human remains, even with these stellar accelerants called tires. Turns out, Avery's have access to a smelter. In fact, the smelter is something that they have on site. Wouldn't that be a much better place to roast a corpse? That gets hot enough to melt metal. But no, they'll burn it in a standard fire pit, to an almost unrecognizable crisp too somehow. So, back to the possibly currently burning body. Were they already burning the body? With what? And why is that not good enough to do the job thus far? If a body is already burning, it's already hot enough. Sure, you'd want to keep that fire going, but it seems to indicate that if that was the case, then they really wouldn't have needed to use these quote-unquote accelerants like tires, which, again, is a dumb argument. Remember the saran wrap condom? But either way, it doesn't logically conclude. Part M. The next paragraph said they stashed the car in the spot where it was eventually found, passing the car crusher and he says he intended to use the car crusher, the sooner the better, and yet somehow forgot within a five-day period. A whole work week. Chris Rock even said once that guys usually get caught by leaving the porn tape in the VCR. But this was killing a person. Kind of different. I can see how you might, might, overlook a bullet under a bench. You didn't see it. Or even a key if it wasn't in plain sight, but you would not forget to crush a car that carried the body of somebody you supposedly just raped and killed. A car crusher and a smelter on the same property are a murderer's dream, yet in this case they're utilized like Ronnie Millsap's driver's license. Part N. As a side note, I just want to say that since I'm obviously recording this after I wrote it, pay close attention to this next part because I address it later on. I doubt what I try to put together is going to affect any legal loophole to get Stephen Avery a new trial, but it's something that I found pretty interesting. And when you tie it in with what follows it, I think it makes a rather eye-opening and compelling argument. The article then states that on February 27th, four months after Teresa Hallbach's disappearance and two days after Stephen Avery's girlfriend Jody writes a request to the two detectives to stop bothering her, they call up Barb Jonda, Brendan Nessie's mom, and she tells him that her son stained his pants with bleach while helping his uncle clean the garage floor on October 31st. And it said they confiscated his jeans. What did they find on his jeans? Nothing would be my guess. I don't remember that being presented as evidence or probable cause to interview him as a suspect at either trial anyway, but that argument that I spoke of earlier pertains to this. Anyway, if Teresa Holbach's blood splatter, even one BB-sized drop was on those jeans, then this whole endeavor of mine would cease. What did they find on his jeans that they brought him in? Was it anything? Why wouldn't they have looked at that when Stephen Avery was being arrested seeing as Brendan Dassey was Stephen Avery's alibi? Wouldn't he have something on those jeans if him and Stephen Avery did it? Yet, after Jody ditches them four months into having nothing to lock Stephen Avery away, they move to Brendan Dassey. Then, after many hours, I believe it's 12 total, of interviewing Brendan Dassey, they charge him with his crimes and tack on three more to Stephen Avery having magically now the trifecta of the MMO that they need. You've seen the interviews from the films. I'll leave it at that for now since I will be watching the Brennan Dassey testimony after this evidence analysis for final analysis to make sure that there isn't something in the testimony that wasn't presented in the film that will have made this a waste of hours of my life. Part O. Racking them up here. 
They have no fingerprint evidence on Teresa Holbach's RAV4, but they miraculously have sweat. Sweat from the sweaty Stephen Avery who did all those horrendous things in his trailer, remember? The trailer to which the DNA tech said absolutely none of Teresa Holbach's DNA was found. Sweat, which probably would have been pretty close to evaporated off him at the time that they finished watching their post-rape TV and watching Brendan Dassey slit the throat of Teresa Halbach and give her a haircut. Did anyone ever ask Brendan Dassey if he watched Sweeney Todd? Anyway, remember the undersheriff said that it would be impossible for them to have Stephen Avery's blood? Which they did, so I guess it's impossible for them to have his sweat too, right? Stephen Avery even says that they could have rubbed the key in my slipper that was next to the newly found key on the seventh search. The kicker to that is, even so, there should have also been Teresa Holbach's DNA on that key as well, by default creating a conspiracy since that was pretty much impossible, especially on a cloth keychain. Part P. Again, when did they discover his sweat DNA? Off the bat or after some witness testimony? Very important. Did they take the time to swab the whole car? How many swab samples did they test? I'd like to know that answer. Did they just swab those spots where the testimony was given, or did they swab other parts? Did they swab the whole thing? Did they swab things like the steering wheel and the gear shift and the door handle, you know, places where somebody's DNA would be likely to show up? Did they find anyone else's DNA in the car? A detailer, a mechanic, a parent, a brother, a friend who may have driven her home from the bar when she had too much to drink, her roommate, her ex. You know, the dude with the scratches on his hand? Part Q. No mutilation, or blood, or brain spatter. Where is the axe or the saw with his or her DNA on it from this mutilation, preferably with his fingerprints on them? Even if they weren't from the event, wouldn't his prints at least be on the tool? They could at least say, well, here's a saw, or here's an axe. This must be what he must have used to mutilate her, and then wiped it completely clean. Hashtag sarcasm to where Luminol can't even find the blood stain. Part R. How did they come to the mutilation charge? From his own words, that lack of physical evidence all but proves didn't happen? Supposedly from a forensic anthropologist, but how did they justify that? Part S. I'll say it one more time. They, the prosecutor's own lab, even said that there is absolutely no DNA evidence that Teresa Halbach was ever in Stephen Avery's trailer, garage, or vehicles, especially for acts this gruesome and horrendous to happen. All they have is a bill of sale, like many before it, and her phone number. Good thing I never got somebody's phone number who just happened to disappear. Part T, there was no DNA in the garage except for Stephen Avery's own DNA, but none of Teresa Halbach or Brendan Dassey. U, there was no DNA in the leg shackles. V, there was no blood on the mattress. And W, there was no marks on the bedpost where somebody tied up and scared for their life would certainly pull hard enough to make marks and possibly break those bedposts. Number 11, the bullet supposedly came from Stephen Avery's gun. Part A, how many bullets were found in the fire? How many times was she shot? 10 times in the stomach and twice in the head, that's from what I know. Yet 11 casings and only one bullet total was found. Is one miraculously missing? How did they determine that number of shots? Testimony? Was it at all from consistent testimony? Part B, he kept a gun above his bed. So what? Okay, granted, sure, Felon's not supposed to have a gun, but, but that aside doesn't change the fact on whether or not he shot her and whether or not he shot her with this gun. Okay, that just makes it easier for cops to fire at anything, including ballistics gel, which you could make on scene to fire a bullet into and then plant it. A 22, you can fire indoors if you want to because there's so little report, i.e. the noise that's generated from the shot. Remember, they had eight days that they were there searching. You could fire into a cinder block and use that if necessary. Part C. If Stephen Avery or Brendan Dassey shot her after they washed up and they are dirty people who don't shower, were they tested for GSR or gunshot residue? Law and Order has been on the air continuously since 1990 and CSI since 2000, both with major spin-offs. Not one person thought to GSR test them? Number 12, the bullet fragment with Teresa Hallbach's DNA on it. Part A. One thing I'd like to find out, aside from if the bullet holes in the skull were made paramortem or postmortem, is the bullet hole size themselves. Most times when a bullet enters the skull, and pay attention parents if you ever need a keen example of how to answer that math conundrum of when am I ever going to use this in real life, 
If you have a small percentage of a perfect circle made by a bullet entering the skull, quite often you will be able to take the known dimensions of that circle and calculate the size or caliber of the bullet from the entrance wound. Did they ever calculate the size of the bullet hole from Teresa Holbach's skull? Assuming, of course, that the bullet holes were made paramortem. They had a forensic anthropologist on the stand, and they did not show any of those answers, at least to my knowledge. When she gave her official testimony of her opinion of how the victim died, she stated, homicidal violence. Did the defense inquire whether or not that she thought it could also have been caused by suicidal violence? If someone has knowledge of whether or not those answers were given, I'd certainly like to know. Part B. In the March 1st press conference, Ken Kratz and Sheriff Potter went asked, is there any DNA evidence to back up this kid's story? Ken Kratz quickly declines to comment on it, but he says, what we can comment on is that there is a lot of physical evidence that we have that now makes sense. Anything makes sense when your story is based off the physical evidence. How can you have a bunch of physical evidence of stabbing, slitting, and gunshots without DNA evidence, yet it all makes sense? In fact, that's the antithesis of it all making sense. Basically, what he's saying is that the physical evidence is all those bullet casings in the garage, even though there are no bullets to be found. Oops, except that one later today, Stephen Avery supposedly shot Teresa Halbach in the garage and there's all these bullet casings, so there you go, voila. Please, if you have evidence to correct me, show me, prove me wrong, I beg you. Part C. Tom Fossbender is probably the highest ranking LAO in this case, and my guess is that the reason he was assigned by the state of Wisconsin was to make sure that there was sort of a referee ensuring that Manitowoc County stayed out of the fray like they were supposed to in order to keep that conflict of interest from becoming a factor and in order to keep the investigation on the up and up, so to speak. Even though Manitowoc County was certainly present in the early part of the investigation on the Avery property right after they found Teresa Hallbach's car, amongst other times. Fossbender works for the Wisconsin Department of Justice, and on the stand, in court, under oath, he didn't remember when this new information was brought to light that would initiate the search that found the magic bullet. Kind of a key bit of evidence and a turning point in both the Stephen Avery and the Brenda Dassey cases, don't you think? In fact, this is where the Brenda Dassey case starts. Up until this point, he's not even considered a suspect and is presumed completely innocent. This is a remarkable claim under oath by Tom Fossbender, especially since he was the detective in the room along with Detective Weger who obtained that information that allowed the search to commence in the first place which miraculously found the magic bullet. How do you, Tom Fossbender, who ascended within the ranks of the Wisconsin State Department of Justice system, conveniently not remember that? And this guy is one of the higher ups at the Wisconsin Department of Justice? Boy, I feel safe. Now I know how Indiana Jones' dad felt when he found out about the Grail Diaries location and wished he would have sent it to the Marx Brothers. Do most lottery winners not remember the day they won? I'm curious because if that's the case, then I could at least buy this giant bologna sandwich. Part D. This bullet fragment found after the testimony in a bloodless, DNA-less garage was either from a headshot or 10 stomach shots according to this article. Had to be from one of those, right? which still leaves one shot missing, which is very strange given the unique nature of 22 caliber bullets. A 22 caliber bullet is a very small caliber. F equals MA, or force equals mass times acceleration. They have a great velocity, especially coming out of the muzzle, but they have no punch. So they are terrible at inflicting damage via body shots to larger animals, but they are great for brain shots, which is why the mob used to use them for hits. Go check out the crime special on the 22 caliber killer from Buffalo, New York. When the guy shot his victims in the head, the bullet would bounce around in the skull and damage the bullet so they couldn't ballistically identify which gun it came from. When he shot them in the body, even if it didn't happen to exit, the bullet was usually torn to pieces, thus making it unidentifiable. Skulls are a little bit different. You have to understand that when a bullet enters the skull, which is basically a round, pressurized compartment protected by hard bone, when a bullet enters the skull, and remember, force equals mass times acceleration, the bullet has enough force to enter the skull, and the pressure from the force intensely displaces the matter like a fat dude jumping into a kiddie pool. Look at the Zabruder tape of the Kennedy assassination. It enters from the back of the skull, and look at the film again, and look at the JFK autopsy photos, you Oliver Stone fans. And when it exits the right forehead area, the exploding tissue force throws him back and to the left. This is true of bigger bullets. However, even though the 22 usually travels faster than larger bullets, unlike the round that killed Kennedy, they don't have the mass to punch through most media and do the same damage. 
The usual scenario with a 22 is that it has little mass and enters the skull and punches through initially, but doesn't have the energy to exit the skull. Thus, it will deflect off the inner skull bone and bounce around like a pool ball, damaging the bullet beyond ballistics recognition. In the process, it shreds the brain, and because brain tissue is not comparatively flexible, brain tissue tears, which is why concussions can be so devastating, the brain tissue tears, hence causing death. The mob would usually have filed the serial numbers off the gun and concealed their fingerprints so they would leave the gun there at the hit scene anyway, since if they don't have a serial number on the gun, and no fingerprints on the gun, the magazine, or the bullets, they can leave the scene with no weapon, so if they're stopped, they can claim innocence. So, you couple that with the concealability of a 22 handgun and the lack of report or the bang it makes when it's fired, and it makes it the perfect weapon for mob hits. If you shoot a melon, it will either explode all over you if the bullet has enough mass and or is moving fast enough, but if the bullet is small enough, it will get lodged in the melon without exiting. So where did this magic bullet come from that the DNA was tainted for the first time in the career of the tech? If it goes through the body, there would be spatter, and it probably would be unidentifiably shredded, but at least it would be on the garage floor, and there would at least be a possibility of retaining its shape for ballistics identification. If it doesn't go through, it would still probably be beyond ballistics recognition, but now it would have wound up in the fire. This is the same paradox as the glove, the blood, and the fingerprints. If the bullet goes through, it winds up in the garage, but there's blood spatter. If a bullet doesn't go through, there's no blood spatter, and it wouldn't be in the garage. Instead, it would wind up in the fire, and the DNA would have been burned off, because the bullet would still be lodged in the skull. It would also probably be ballistically unidentifiable. You can't have one or the other. Part E. This magic bullet being found, of course, assumes that the two gunshot wounds to her head and the 10 to her body were caused by a 22 caliber and that there was at least an exit wound. I stated before that the size of the gunshot hole to the skull and whether it was paramortem or postmortem is rather important, but the quick animation that they had up on the screen would seem to indicate that she was shot in the head twice and 10 times in the body, yet no exit wound. That's not really possible. I'll repeat that because it's just like the car key in the cop's possession. If there's no exit wound, then the bullet fragment by definition is a plant. Look up the definition of by definition if you're confused. But again, if there's no exit wound, then that bullet, if it has her DNA on it, was planted. Then you add the crazy fact that the magic bullet, even though it was contaminated, was allowed against protocol to be entered into evidence. That right there should raise some major red flags. I mean, that would be like Tiger Woods competing in the Senior Pro Tour and nobody saying a word. The Wisconsin State Crime Lab DNA tech for the prosecution explained the process she used in order to quote unquote, get any residual DNA from the bullet. For her to test, she had to use a buffer solution. What? A bullet that is strong enough to penetrate and exit the skull or the body is going to have visible blood and or tissue on it. Not to mention that if this bullet was found in the garage on March 1st in northern Wisconsin with snow still on the ground and it being sealed off since November, that means the average temperature would have been cold enough to preserve that tissue in almost its purest form and yet she had to use a special technique in order to extract DNA from this bullet that had no visible blood or tissue? They testified that it had no visible blood or tissue even though it supposedly went through a skull or a body. And how does one use up the entire DNA sample from a bullet that went through a skull or body? Even so, if you thought that there was so little DNA there, why would you not replicate the sample? Why would you not use PCR or polymerase chain reaction, which even then had been around for at least two decades and is one of the most common procedures in the world of genetics, the process to which basically makes all genetic testing and profiling possible in order to replicate thousands of copies of a single DNA strand or an entire genome in the most prolific case in Wisconsin of the 21st century so that you have numerous test samples for your future use? Why? Why would you not do that? I can think of a pretty good reason. Even if this was a complete accident to use up the whole sample in one shot without replicating the genome, situations like this misappropriation give this case more conspiracy theorist fodder than Roswell freaking New Mexico. And as a result, two men who may very well be spending the rest of their lives behind bars while this work mistake is nothing more to this tech than, oops, accidentally ordering meat on Lent Friday. This is despicable. 
And what's worse is that there are people out there who have listened to this whole thing and still don't believe it or still don't care. She has the perfect alibi for her mistake too. Some student witnesses who don't know what to look for could have watched her do that whole misstep and not know any better. Did they ask the students who witnessed that mistake what they saw or what she did when that happened? I would have. Part G, the reason that this is so important. This is the one piece of evidence that could rock solidly break this case and for the prosecution even. Forget that the bullet wasn't found right away. Forget the argument that if there's an exit wound, there's blood splatter everywhere to which there absolutely was none. Again, assuming that the forensic analysis of the skull showed the bullet caliber was consistent with that of a 22, forget the opposing argument to whether the 22 bullet, if it did stay in the head, that you'd have no ballistic evidence to tie the gun to the bullet because it would have been smushed and it would have still been in her head and in the fire where the DNA evidence would have been burned off, coupled with the fact that the bullet then wouldn't have even been in the garage. Forget the fact that they stated that there was no visible blood or brain tissue on a bullet that went 2,000 feet per second out of the average muzzle of a 22 caliber rifle through someone's skull and brain or body, but just DNA was on it. Despite all that, the one piece that at least I have seen so far that without a doubt, minus the circumstances, would at least tie Stephen Avery to the gun, not necessarily Stephen Avery firing it, but at least his gun to the bullet that went through Teresa Hallbach's head or body, the person running the test, a seasoned professional in about as high of a position as you can get at the state level Department of Justice crime lab in the biggest case of her life when she has never made this mistake before in her entire career, including schooling and training, not only does it make a copy of the genome, but messes up the sample. And why? Because out of all the times she decides to show students something, she talks through the lesson. And she does this instead of concentrating harder than ever before to make sure that this one piece of evidence that is the key to proving Stephen Avery's guilt doesn't get screwed up. Come on, that's like sitting in a bar with Elizabeth Banks and as you guys are discussing the possibility of going back to her hotel room, you're gonna take a phone call from your buddy Bob to discuss who's bringing what snacks to Tim's house to watch the football game? Garbage, nobody would do that. Nobody would sit at the precipice of one of the top three, if not the top moments of their life and almost certainly of their career to mess it up in such a mundane way. I don't buy it. And the scary thing is that the questionable methods and results are also coming from the state level law enforcement and federal level law enforcement, as well as the labs. I don't know if any of this hints at conspiracy or favoritism, but it does hint at misconduct or at least incompetence. This is the closest thing that remotely brings physical evidence that Stephen Avery did it, even though there's no corroborating evidence of how it got there, and even though reasonable doubt can still be cast because Proovy fired it. Where did the shot actually take place? Where's the spatter and the brain tissue everywhere, etc.? But at least it was tying physical evidence to Stephen Avery with her DNA, and now it's bogus. If anyone can post some other sort of proof like this, a piece of non-tampered physical evidence to at least have me question his guilt, 